Hey, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Scott Luton and Kevin L. Jackson with you here on Supply Chain. Now, welcome to today's live stream. Kevin, how you doing today? I am doing great, man. You know, I, uh, I'm pretty sure winter is over. I am. Um, we had a great cherry blossom festival here in D.C., and summer is peeking around the corner, man. <laughs> hey, don't rush us. I'm not looking forward to those 114 <laughs> degree days here in Georgia, but I like how you think. Uh, and you know, we're yeah. moving fast forward into a beautiful springtime season. But Kevin, speaking of beautiful things, simplicity mm -hmm. is a beautiful thing. Am I right? Simplicity. Yeah. So especially I mean, life, but, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but simplicity, especially in this complex world we live in, global supply chain and otherwise for that matter. Today, mm -hmm. we're gonna be talking with a couple of business leaders as we look into simpler but effective and successful alternatives to material handling and a whole bunch more. Now, our challenges, Kevin, don't always require the most complex, sophisticated, and expensive systems that sometimes can bring in friction into operations. Let's keep it simple if we can. Am I right, Kevin? Yeah, you know, I, I think that it's really important to try to go for that simplicity, especially in today's world of constant change. I completely, completely, wholeheartedly uh, agree with you. So, folks, we got a great show teed up. Kevin and I are looking forward to uh, talking supply chain and supply chain tech uh, in just a moment. But, hey, two last reminders before we get going here. Hey, let us know what you think. Share your comments throughout this live discussion, just like Ross here, who's tuned in from Jacksonville, Florida, via LinkedIn. Hey, Ross, great to have you here. Let us know what you think. And as you comment throughout the session, let us know where you're tuned in from. Uh, and, of course, Kevin, if folks enjoy today's show, be sure we want them to share it with their friend, their network, uh, because they'll be glad they did. Am I right? You know, these live streams are so much fun. Yeah, absolutely. But if you missed the live stream, it's on demand, too. So you can catch us later. That's right. On demand, baby. Uh, Jeff Tomlinson also tuned in via LinkedIn from London. Great to have you here, Jeff. Looking forward to your take throughout the session. So, Kevin. I want to bring in our two featured guests today. Folks are in for a treat. All right. uh, Matt Cooper, VP Global Sales and Applications with Bastion Solutions, and his colleague, Alex Haynes, Director of BizDev and Strategic Accounts, and who I like to call the Ray Romano of Global Supply Chain. Stay tuned. <laughs> hey, hey, Alex, great to have you back. How you doing? I'm doing great and uh, hopefully still sounding like the Ray Romano supply chain. Oh, gosh. To our <laughs> listeners and viewers out there, listen to that. I'm going to tell you, you'll make the connection in just a second. And Matt, how you doing? Great to have you here. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. You bet. You bet. All right, Kevin, we got a lot to get into. But before we go any further, uh, mm -hmm. let's start with a fun warm-up question. So, folks, Alex, Matt, Kevin, all y'all out there, looks like we got some Kansas City fans uh, tuned in. Great to see you. Uh, today is World Cloud Security Day. Kevin, that's just for you. Okay. It is yeah, World yeah. <laughs> it's World Party Day. I'm not sure where that started. And it's mm. American Circus Day. So somewhere the Ringland Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus and their relatives are celebrating maybe with a parade or two. But we want to dial it in, Alex and Matt, because Kevin and I have done our homework on the great outdoors. And that's not just a great movie from the 80s uh, with John Candy and Dan Aykroyd, right? But both of y'all, Alex and Matt, you're big outdoors enthusiasts, hiking, mountain climbing, water skiing, who knows? So I want to ask both of y'all, we'll start with you, Alex. What has been one of your favorite and recent activities outdoors? Good question. Um, I would say, besides taking my kids out camping and doing a little backpacking, right. probably climbing Mount Rainier with my buddies. That was great. Wonderful achievement mm. and a lot of fun. And I loved it. Beautiful. We couldn't ask for anything better. So hoping to uh, get to the top of Grand Teton this year. We'll see. Okay. Oh, so wow. Mount Rainier, how, how tall is that compared? I mean, is that, uh, I'm trying to so, think of my geographic facts. Is that, that's not the tallest peak in the U.S., is it? It is not. Mount Whitney is. We did that last year. But Mount Rainier is the most glaciated peak. So it's there's no real easy way. You got to hike up glaciers and use crampons and axes and make sure you don't fall in a Serac, which is cool. It makes it part of the adventure, right? So a little Sounds more like supply chain, oh. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds scary. But, but it's kind of interesting because 
my son lives outside of Seattle, and they go up to uh, Premier all the time, but they don't bring all their gear. I must, you must go past the red line or something. <laughs> yeah, you got to go to the top. You can get up so high, but go to the top and make sure you uh, you don't kill yourself. Yeah, it's great. All right, yeah. Alex, we're going to have to get pictures or it didn't happen. So next time you join us, you're going to have to bring some pictures, all right? Sounds beautiful, though. Yeah. Uh, all right, Matt, that's going to be tough to beat. Matt, Alex over there climbing peaks from around the world. What do you do now? You're you're on the lake a lot. I understand, Matt. Is that right? That is correct. I like to keep it more uh, on the ground level and not quite uh, so high in the air. It's not quite as dangerous. <laughs> Heard uh, that. I love, what? To, love to be out on the water. I love to, to water ski, wakeboard, wake surf, anything on the water. Just is my happy place. And after a week of doing supply chain excitement, I like to pull off a little bit of steam on the water. Oh, I love that, uh, Kevin. <laughs> I think one of the things he mentioned was uh, like wakeboarding. Uh, have you have you ever wakeboarded behind a, a boat, a, a speedboat, Kevin? No, I have not. But uh, ski, you know, one of those uh, skidoos dragged me behind it for a while. Does that count? <laughs> that wasn't no. intentional. Is that what you're saying, Kevin? <laughs> no, no, no. But you know, I I I enjoy the outdoors, but I don't know if. Uh, Chasing the neighborhood feral cat that counts as an outdoor activity. Um, and I, I was actually hoping we'd go back to World Party Day. Hey. <laughs> uh, come Friday, we will. Okay. We'll celebrate a couple right. days late. Uh, Matt and Alex, thanks for sharing a little bit about what y'all do when you're not doing big things across global supply chain, then some, because Bastion Solutions clearly has been on the move. And Alex, it's great to have you back uh, and get an update on a lot of things y'all have got going. Uh, all right. So to that end, that's a perfect segue, Kevin, Alex, and Matt. Perfect segue, because we want to offer up some context here on the front end. So Alex, as I mentioned, great to have you back. Let's remind a few folks out there. I know Bastion Solutions has grown since the last time you were with us a year or two ago. But what does the company do in a nutshell? And tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. No, appreciate you asking. So Bastion Solutions, been in business for 72 years. Um, in 2017, we were acquired by Toyota. So we're part of the Toyota Advanced Logistics Group. Mm -hmm. And really, our focus is integrating multiple technologies for customers. So we're a supply chain automation integrator. We're focused on automating material handling, primarily in distribution centers, also in, distribu uh, also in manufacturing plants. We've got uh, sites across North America, Canada, Mexico, and we support our customers globally through Toyota. But we're kind of focused on finding the right solution as an engineering company first. Um, in terms of my background, um, I've been with Bastion in a sales capacity during my time, worked with some of our key accounts, worked on uh, what we call a solutions account executive, uh, working on some of the bigger projects we did. And then I've been uh, also supporting business development as well as some of our key customers. And uh, my background's really been supply chain across automation, as well as inventory planning globally. So thanks. Yeah, Alex, I can tell you, uh, Kevin, you may have picked up with us in the pre-show. Um, Alex, first off, he's a fellow space enthusiast, like the two of us, uh, Kevin, but that yeah. engineering focus he mentioned, it's very evident in every conversation I have with Alex, uh, objectives. Well, what are we doing here? And then we get started and I bet he applies that with laser, like, uh, a laser like approach to helping folks find the right solutions for the right business needs. So Alex, great to have you here as always, uh, Matt. So now that we we've you know kind of uh, connected dots for folks about what Bastion does and a little bit about Alex's background, how about your background? So I um, out of college I decided to enter the supply chain world, and I've done everything in this space from um, straight engineering solutions to project management to account management. I came to Bastion to do um, solution account executive, like Alex talked about. And then right. from there, went on to do more and more leadership roles inside of Bastion. Okay, man. So, uh, Kevin, what I'm hearing there from Matt is he's done a little bit of everything across uh, supply chain, the supply chain space. Did you hear that too, Kevin? Well, I was really uh, so surprised about the fact that he said, out of college, I went straight into, uh, you know, supply chain. It wasn't like, you know, I wanted to be a fireman. I wanted to be an astronaut. I want to go straight into supply chain. Like, wow, you know, how, how did you do that with your, your daddy and your daddy's daddy and your mama's mama in supply chain? Uh, <laughs> it was in the family. Kevin, I'm a, I'm a first generation supply chain person. Um, I think more than, <laughs> su 
truth be told, more than supply chain was the fact the job was in Chicago and I wanted to live in Chicago. Uh, so that might be why I got into supply chain, but let's keep that between us. Well, I love that. And kidding aside, I think whenever whenever I meet first generation supply chain folks, it just reminds me of the work, great work we all have to do to keep that pipeline coming in because there's so much great talent that just isn't yeah. aware of the immense opportunities that global supply chain offers. So um, and speaking of Kevin, Alex and Matt, I was doing a little poking around. I'm good at that, doing a little homework. And Bastion Solutions, speaking of talent, has been named a best place to work this year in a variety of states, coast to coast. So I love organizations that invest in uh, their cultures and 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 their jobs and their people. Uh, all right, so want to get in more into the supply chain focus discussion here today, and we're going to be mm-hmm. talking, Kevin, really focusing on successfully and powerfully finding some extra simplicity in our supply chains, which again is a beautiful thing, especially when it comes to keeping things moving. So yeah. I want to keep uh, and Kevin, that's really. That's the the backbone of supply chain. We we talk about it in, in holistic terms, but we got to keep things moving, right? Movement is the well, name of the game. Yes, but you know, over the past few years, we haven't been able to figure that out. You know, with respect to supply chain being onshore, or going offshore, or going midshore, or multiple shore, or you know, do we just throw it all away or rebuild it? I mean. Your t- um, simplicity is uh, a challenging thing in that environment. It sure is. There's lots of friction and complexity out there. And I thank you for bringing that back to our attention. You know, so whenever we can find simplicity, especially simplicity that really works, that's yeah. what we've got to lean into. So I want to, um, Alex and Matt, to that end, I want to level set a bit. Uh, there's so many different uh, uh, phraseologies, I'll put it out there across global supply chain. We found we found some commonality in some places, but in other places we kind of talk about a pail on this end and a bucket on that end. So let's bring everybody together here. When we talk about automated point solutions and distribution process solutions, Alex, what are we talking about? <clears throat> well, I think it goes to your theme of simple. That's really what it is. So a point solution is something that's typically simple to design, install, mm-hmm. support, um, they're typically solving a really specific problem. So if you look at the distribution center, you're, you're doing a lot of different things, but this solution or these solutions are really kind of uh, focused on looking at one area and how do we solve that particular problem for the customer? So what some people will call these is like productized solutions. So it's not a product like you would buy and you just drop it off and you start running it, but it's closer to that than an integrated solution. So it's something you're going to put on site it's going to need some type of engineering design and interface work, but it's ready to go pretty quick. You can deploy them quickly. You can do it at a lower cost, at a lower risk. Um, it's something that's going to solve that particular biggest area of pain. And so there's been more, you've seen all this investment and focus on more of these sort of productized solutions and looking at ways to say, we know this is a problem. Let's find a more easy way to solve this problem with something somebody can do quickly and they can do it at a lower cost and lower barrier to entry, especially because a lot of customers that have these problems, you know, it's harder for them to justify these types of investments over multiple years. How do you do it over a shorter time frame? So that's why those types of productized solutions have seen a lot of traction. We're talking about these things with customers and trying to just keep it simple. And then on the other end, you've got integrated solutions which are really typically more complex. They're customized. They're going to solve more challenges and more problems. They're going to take more time to engineer. They're going to take more time to understand the business requirements. So that's kind of the other end of the spectrum. And so I think we'll talk about that probably in a bit. Yeah. uh, And I'm going to come to you next, Matt, but I love a couple of themes there from Alex. Um, Focus is such a powerful thing, right? It's such a powerful thing, whether we're talking about in a distribution center, manufacturing center, or in startups, right? And all points in between. Uh, and being able to right size solutions with what you need, the right scale, the right solution at the right time for the right pain in the business. I love that. Uh, Matt, what else would you add as Alex was talking about those two different approaches? Um, I think the point solution in general is um, really good for entering into that automation space. It's starting your automation journey because as Alex talked about, it's very simple. You can put that solution in place and get up and running very quickly and start to recognize that um, uh, ROI or that return right away. 
Mm, I love that. Kevin, hey, we're all at different moments in the automation yeah. journey as Matt's talking about, right? We've got some early movers, early adopters that are well down the path, right? Uh, and then you have other organizations that um, haven't done as good of a job. Many of these groups are trying to get business done today, and they've been a little bit slower in trying to fi find the right toehold in their automation journey. And I like how Matt says these point solutions kind of allow you to toe dip it, right? And kind of crawl <laughs> before you walk, before you run. Your thoughts there, Kevin? Yeah, you know, when I was listening to Alex, the thing that came to my mind was, you know, you have to meet the customer where they are, where they are. You know, some customers are at the very beginning of the journey, or they they've been wayward and they're trying to figure out how to automate, and they have, need something to get a, a quick win, that quick hitter. So the point solution, although we may address it as being simple, it's effective. Right. right. That's the most important aspect of it. That's a, a excellent point. First off, whenever I hear wayward, I think it was it the Boston tune, my wayward son or, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> but secondly, and, and kidding aside, um, uh, simple does not mean um, not doesn't it doesn't mean it's not powerful or effective. Right, right. I mean, it really is. Yeah. It's, it's okay. complex. It's a very complex process oftentimes to find the simplicity that really makes it happen um okay sort of like a magic sort of like a magician right it looks so simple but when you when you understand that what happens in the background it's very very complex right yes. but from the user's point of view it's exactly. simple that's well, powerful we like to make the analogy with customers that look everybody knows the culture cultural norms that apple pioneered and the expectation mm. is get there. I mean, the hardware in our pockets and the software is exponentially uh, complex, but it's very simple to us. And so that's where you see the market going. Excellent yeah. point. I love that. Uh, so let's talk about it being more accessible. You know, that's kind of, it's a great segue to the next question. I want to start with you, Matt. You know, what makes these automation point solutions in your experience much more accessible for organizations. You called it the those that are really starting the automation journey in some cases. What helps with that, uh, uh, making it easier to plug and play, so to speak? There's just a lot fewer barriers to entry. Um, you look at, if you think about automating a half a million square foot warehouse, it's a very large CapEx investment. And so if you think about, I wanna solve a specific problem, it takes that CapEx down to a much more manageable size for a lot of organizations. Um, additionally, they're normally a lot quicker to implement. When we do a the large automated system, it can be a three-year process between the analyzing, the design, the installation, and then the go live, right? There's a lot of lead time in there. So if you're going to make that type of commitment, you don't really start from that crawl space to then go into that I call it sprinting, I guess, or running, right? Right. Um, so right, right. that quick term is important, I think, and makes them um, makes these solutions more um, attractive. Um, and really, they're just not as as complex as that large automated system, right? Yeah. You can not be as disruptive to your operations. So I love that, Matt uh, and Alex. As Matt was sharing his perspective there, what came to my mind is organizations where they've got a burning pain, burning platform. You find a point solution to address that. It's quick to implement. They'll get immediate returns, and it'll help them take more steps forward into a more holistic automation journey. So what came to my mind, is that right? And what else would you add in terms of what makes these automation point solutions more accessible? Yeah, no, you're spot on. I'll give you a couple examples because I think that just always helps paint a bit of a picture and add some color here. But like even really simple things, such as we've seen a huge increase in just modular conveyor. So what is that? Typical conveyor, it's a CapEx, you design it, you understand what your requirements are and you bolt it to the ground, you install electrical, you put controls, you do this whole thing and it's fixed and it's there for a specific reason. I mean, now you look at it, you can go buy with standard spec modular conveyor and it's got controls already embedded, the electrical's ready, it's ready to plug into 110 there's a uh there's an e-stop and you go right so you got a customer real simple stuff you know i'm going to bring it off the truck i'm going to put it in 
I'm going to plug it in. It's going to help me just be more efficient of maybe a sort or moving product through. I mean, even stuff like that. So you don't have to even think automation in terms of robotics and AGVs and AMRs and all these other things. There's really simple things mm -hmm. like that. We tend to also think about, you know, some of these AMRs and AGVs, you drop them off. There's a limited, uh, limited uh, turn time in terms of understanding the facility and the operations. You map it, you set it up for you what you want to do and you get it going. And when you want to make a change, it's not that hard to make a change. The user interfaces are easy. It's kind of like using your iPhone, right? Everybody's trying to be like that. How do I make it more like my phone? Make Man. it simple. Okay, Kevin, that's music to my ears, uh, Kevin, oh. because one of the elements that he finished, Alex finished his thoughts on, is making it easier on the people, the team, the human factor, to have a successful day, right? <laughs> Kevin, your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, my thought is that humans are always afraid, right? So you have this, you have to address that range of fear. And I, and I think these point solutions, while they're very powerful, they are focused on, I guess, uh, addressing or eliminating that fear of change. So mm -hmm. you could come in and say, no, you don't have to, you know, change everything and bring a uh, army of consultants in and take three to four years before you go live, you know, no, 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 we can come in, we can dress. We, we have the scratch for that itch right now. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> uh, hey, when Alex and Matt back up the solution dump truck uh, to the back of the facility, <laughs> I mean, when I'm hearing Alex and Matt talk, I mean, it is set up and it's quick. And Kevin, to your point, it's not the three to four year implementation and hey there's some cases that that calls for that level of detail and yeah, that scope yeah. i'm not taking we're not we're all not taking anything away from that but sometimes we're in the beautiful position to keep things simple and see the problem and nail it with the right solution right size for the customer um Absolutely. Yeah, we've seen a, a lot of clients who are especially with the e-commerce boom they're startups they have a unique product or they have a new unique um, solution and mm -hmm. They just need to get marginally better to help improve the bottom line, right? It's not an all in. We need to change the world. We just need to get a little bit better. And that starts their journey. And as they grow, then these solutions can be added. As they grow, the solutions can grow and make them even more efficient. Okay. So it's an, um, part of what I'm hearing you say is that ongoing relationship where you work with an organization, I bet, in one specific area. And then as they grow, the relationship part grows because their needs change. Um, Alex and Matt, and Alex, I'm going to start with you with this next um, question because my hunch is um, selection is so critical. The whole selection process as these organizations, distribution centers, manufacturing teams, you name it, a wide range of, of pain points, and they're looking at a wide range of solutions. So let's talk about selection, some best practices there. So when folks are evaluating both the pinpoint solutions, the automation point solutions, and the broader uh, distribution process solutions. I think y'all use a different name there, but what are some things that our audience has got to know when it comes to the selection and evaluation? So I love this question because it's really easy to go to any of our industry trade shows and treat it like you're going to a car dealership and you're going, well, I like this one. And I like the features <laughs> of this one better. And I think I'm going to buy this yeah. one. I'll get a little more torque or, you know, higher end or whatever it is. Right. And the challenge is bucket seat. <laughs> There's truth to that. But at the end of the day, the problem is all of these have really important nuances and you have to understand what particular technology fits for whatever those unique problems are. And the more problems you're trying to solve, the more information, data and understanding of your business requirements you have to have to say, OK, are we going beyond a point solution? Do we need to look at other things? If we do start with the point solution, let's make sure what we do is we don't box ourselves in. And we have the ability to expand it. So what Matt's talking about is growing over time. If you build something and don't think about the future at all, you can run into challenges of how do you expand it. So what you want to do is really think, all right, I'm here. I'm going to be here. If I go big, it's going to be here. But if I go small, it's going to be here. Maybe it's somewhere in between. But you want to talk to people that understand how to kind of look at it objectively and give you options, right? But you could do, right, this, yeah. you could do this, you could do this. And if you want to grow over time, great. We can start small and we can grow into it. So a lot of it is just like, it's like anything, finding a trusted advisor and the sea of 
you know, options and technologies and things like that. How do you figure out where to go and how to start? I love that. Yeah. Uh, Matt, what would you add to that? I mean, I think it's important when you're dealing with, when you're looking, as Alex said, on the, on the used car lot or the car lot, you have, you have a, a, a guide with you, right? Because um, if you're not thinking holistically and you're not working with someone who's thinking holistically about doing this and does this day in and day out, um, you may go to uh, the car lot and get what the car person wants to give you, not right. necessarily what you need. You might need four wheel drive, but you might not know you need four wheel drive. So all of a sudden you're getting a two wheel drive car and it's not going to get you to where you need to go. Mm. Right. Um, so having the experience of integrating systems um, like we do, I feel like it gives you that um, holistic view and holistic understanding of where as the customer you would like to end up. Right. And then once we understand that through a you know, data driven approach, um, a single integrator type model can help you, I guess, um, kind of get through some of the noise that is out there with every different, you know, we walked the Modex show here recently. Yeah. And there are, there are AMRs on every single street corner, so to speak, on that Modex walk. Yeah. Right? Which one's right for you? What is the next step for you? Um, having like an integrator who's able to really understand objectively obsess or objectively assess and then help guide, I think is very critical in this situation. Completely agree. Completely agree. Uh, especially as you put it, this, this tidal wave of solutions are really cool robotics that are on a lot of corners, you know, automation, you name it. And uh, by the way, Alex, what, what I mentioned as you were starting your response, you, I loved your car analogy and Kevin, I'm coming to you right next, but uh, I'm looking yeah. for bucket seats and that clear coat finish like <laughs> our friends from uh, Fargo. Uh, Kevin, speak to the I, I love how Alex and Matt are offering their perspective and expertise on the selection process because it's so much it, there's so much truth there. So many business leaders and teams. Been, yeah. I've been there and done it. We're in so much pain. We see something we like and we want to kind of mail it in, you know, fast forward through the yeah. selection process. And that's how we can lose sometimes your thoughts, Kevin. So uh, Matt was um, talking about, uh, he may not have said it, but he was addressing the experience, the importance of experience. Mm. I mean, uh, Bastion has had so many customers, so many clients that have seen so many different processes. They've, they've, they've seen successes and they've seen the failure. They've seen what works and they see what doesn't really work. And if you're going to go into this automation, you need that Sherpa. You know, you need someone who's been there, has done right. that, and can tell you which which way to go. I was wondering if Matt was helping Alex when they went to the top of Mount Rainier. Is, <laughs> is Matt a, a Sherpa and is in the real in his <laughs> other job? <laughs> Sherpa, what a great. I'd forgotten about that word completely, Kevin. Kevin, you always help me expand my vocabulary. I love it when you uh, <laughs> co-host with me. Uh, my, I'll tell you, uh, and Alex, of course, we've had the benefit of you being with us uh, a while back and, and kind of seeing you in action again. But uh, that Sherpa approach, that holistic approach that I'm going to sell you the right thing. I'm going to implement the right thing. I'm not going to give if you want if you only need right? Uh, solution A, I'm not going to give you the whole alphabet. That is so important. And when it comes to uh, building trust in these relationships mm. that both of all, all of us are talking about, that's a big part of it, right? Um, I'll get y'all, Alex, get you to respond to that really quick before we keep on moving. You know, it, it's trust is such a big part of the, not just the selection process, but the whole relationship. Would you agree? Yeah. And, and it's really important to call this out. And it's funny because you know, I think when I first started my career, I was very transactional, like probably like a lot of people are, right? That's right. And you yeah. think you're smart. You think you can figure everything out. You know, I'm going to do my own due diligence and no problem, right? And I'll just treat everybody like somebody who's going to provide me with everything I need and then I'll make the decision. And, you know, I'm not that old, but as I've gotten older, <laughs> I quickly realized that I need to have people that I can listen and learn from, take notes and understand how to trust them. And not just from selection, but like, you know, at the end of the day, um, well-established organizations have a goal to meet their shareholders' needs. Everybody does. But yeah. the big goal yeah. is to be around for a long time, you know, and make sure that you're supporting your customers is the only way to do that. And to make sure that they're successful, 
so that you can be successful. And it's easy to say that, right? And it's common for people to say, we've got to make our customers successful. But <clears throat> at the, I'd say like, at least from my personal experience, that is one of those things where working with companies who have experience, decades of experience and are going to be around for a long time, right. Ashton, other, in, other companies, um, other OEMs, you know, yeah. understanding their roadmap for the next five, 10 years tells a lot about how your selection process should function. Are they planning on being around? And if they are, they're most likely going to be trying to do the right thing. Excellent comments there, Alex. Kevin, you you were nodding your head a little bit before I move on. What Anything <laughs> really sticks out yeah. to you what Alex was sharing? Yeah. I mean, if uh, in order for a business to uh, have longevity, that business's customers have to have longevity, right? So if they're successful, you're successful. I mean, there's a linkage. There's right. a linkage there. There's a reason why companies have been around for, for hundreds of years. Uh, uh, because their customers have been around for hundreds of years. Right. Excellent point. That, a strong linkage. Uh, no gotta, doubt. I do think, I want to add here, yeah. kind of go back to that Sherpa idea, right? Because I really do like that um, that Sherpa idea. If you're having, um, if you're out looking for an individual point solution, yeah. you want to understand how these different point solutions can all play together as you grow and expand. What you don't want to create is separate islands in your warehouse and not have it be a cohesive um, system as you grow and need it to be uh, all functioning together. Matt, that's an excellent comment because uh, we want to invest in solutions that can grow with the business. They're not good for a year, but to your point, they all, they all play nice in the sandbox and they can serve the ecosystem, the, the, the enterprise for, for uh, a long time to come and finding that kind of expertise, Kevin, Right. That, yeah, okay. that is not short sighted, you know, that that's really big yeah. picture, that roadmap that Alex was talking about. That's critical, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to have the Sherpa taking you down that uh, that path that ends in a dead dead <laughs> end. Right. <laughs> so you don't want to a point solution may look good right now, but if you go that way, then you run into a dead end from the business and expansion point of view. Mm -hmm. You have to go all the way back to the beginning. That's I right. Think Sherpa is right, Matt. I, I, I like that. I like that thought. I do too. I do too. All right, and I'm glad you added that, uh, Matt, because uh, you know, going back to Alex's front end of his response there about being transactional, you know, we need to be holistic. We need to think uh, from a roadmap perspective. You know, there's a lot of practitioners out there in these operations that are, are thinking of today's pain, and it's, what I'm hearing is both of y'all look to have these big picture conversations so that we're making the right decisions, not only for today, but for the longer term. And that's really important. Yeah. Um, sure. Okay. Got to ask the million dollar to billion dollar question. I'll use the right, right uh, analogy <laughs> there. Finance options, right? I know y'all work with a whole range of, of, of businesses, the younger businesses, the more established businesses and all points in between. How can we make the finance options, Alex, more accessible? for business leaders out there? Um, I would just say it's a byproduct of the market maturing. So there's a lot of investment companies, a lot of banks that are now very open to providing really unique financing options that didn't exist five years ago. Um, you know, I give you, there's a lot of robots as a service models. There's a lot of um, automation financing. So some of these solutions, they can amortize it over longer periods. They don't assume it's going to get have residual value and get sold somewhere else. They know you're going to be around for a while. They're willing to take a risk. They're willing to help you finance it. They're looking for ways to turn that CapEx into an OpEx. They know the gap rules. They understand it better now. How do they get the CapEx away from your balance sheet on automation and shift it to an OpEx mm -hmm. if that's what you're looking for? We've got companies we work with that are now looking at automating, I'm sorry, financing the full building plus automation inside of that. And when you combine those two, you go an overall uh, lower monthly lease, and that helps justify better buildings, better solutions, or saving some of that CapEx and putting it somewhere else. So what we've seen is just a rapid change in how some of these companies and these investments are, are, are adopting this. And we're helping, we're trying to just help connect our customers to those, those people so they can have those conversations. Wow. That's right. Yeah. Blessed are the connectors, Kevin. Yeah, I think it says another thing that even the the, uh, um, the the money people know that 
businesses have to go to automation. You know, <laughs> if you're not going to automation, you're not going to be a, a business for much longer. So um, if the accountants are saying, are looking at your decision as a good thing, so good they're willing to give you and put together that unique financial package to make it good for you for the long term, then you, you better believe that others are doing it as well. Yep. Excellent point. And, you know, Kevin and I, uh, Matt, I'll come to you in just a second. Uh, Kevin, you and I talk about our immense um, passion for the human factor in industry, right? Yeah. It, but at the same time, to your point, you just mentioned uh, in some portions of global supply chain, there's no other way to do it than to lean into innovative technology. There's just, you can't throw enough people at some of these problems out there. It's come yeah. up in previous shows. So excellent point there, Kevin. Um, Matt, anything else to add on the finance side? What we're hearing from Alex is that there's a lot more options these days because as Kevin put it, automation is such a big part of where business is and where we're going. Anything else to add, Matt? I mean, there are a lot of options now. It has really surprised me um, how the financing has helped enable companies to start their journey into automation or continue their journey into automation, depending on where they're at in the balance sheet, um, you know, this year or next. So having those options for all of our customers um, really just opens the doors to helping them solve all their problems. It's been a great change in the industry. Excellent. Excellent point there. Before long, we're going to be having, uh, Kevin, you called it the money people. They're not going to be the money people. They're going to be the money bots uh, before long. The money bots. <laughs> the money bots. Um, okay. That's good to know, Alex and Matt. Uh, it makes so much sense. I've never really thought about that, uh, the financial piece there, but I bet there is a ton more options. And clearly y'all, part of what you help in, in, in the, your suite so, of yeah. services is helping to make those connections, which I think is really, really valuable. What were you going to say, uh, Kevin? That's that experience, right? That's right. They, 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 they know the pain points, not just from the business point of view, uh, but but from the, the revenue, the top line and bottom line aspect. That's critical. That's right. So this next question is maybe as much as I've enjoyed y'all's perspective thus far and having uh, Alex uh, back with us and, and meeting Matt for the first time, um, you know, PDCA, <clears throat> PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, right? I'm a big old fan of that cycle. I uh, spent several years of my life living every day, a Lean Six Sigma um, uh, lifestyle. Uh, and I stole this this um, cycle from how y'all do business. And I think I got this right. And Alex and Matt, I'm counting on you to tell me if I don't. Let's see here. Define, design, engage, execute, commission or go live, and then support. And so often, Alex and Matt, support is not a part Less so these days than it was a while back, but support is not oftentimes part of that cycle. And I think, y'all, that's one of the areas that you really invest a ton of resources, time and energy and expertise into. So when it comes to that critical aftercare, we'll call it, what should our audience members be looking for when it comes to technical support with y'all or with any of the providers they're evaluating out there? Uh, Matt, let's go with you first. I think support is, is key. You know, we talked about the show and walking around and seeing all these different shiny objects. That's the exciting part, right? Getting excited to see what's out there and, and saying we can make this work for our solution. We can make this improve our business. What kind of gets forgotten is how do you support this once it's in? All of a sudden you have this, this monument of automation into your, in your building. And how do you make sure that it continues to work the way that you intended it to work over the years? Mm. Right. And so, um, one thing to be cautious of is, is who is the support network for that point solution? Um, is it the salesperson and, and one other engineer, or do they have a team of people that are actually able to support those products? Because the last thing you want to have, and I I know personally of an example where the um, the customer had a solution that they brought in, and there was one person that could support this technology, and that person loved to ride horses. So when that person was on a horse, guess who wasn't getting support, right? So you have to wait for him to get off his horse, get back to where there's a, a internet connection, and he can dial in. But it was crippling for the organization, and they didn't make that connection. That not having that support, way down the road, again the sales and and installation, everything was great, but having that support down the road is is critical because you actually spend a lot of time, and this is this is your business. This is critical for you. 
and not to be yeah. able to keep it running and keep that support is is huge. Yes, Matt. Excellent, excellent point. Uh, and I got to throw this in, Matt, Alex, and Kevin. You brought up horses, Matt. We just, me and Amanda spent some time in Columbia last weekend. And uh, a 20-year-old horse that was being used in the sheriff's department for PR and appearances, well, the horse passed away. This is a real story. And the horse's mm. name was Naked. And the whole reason he was named Naked is so they could promote, come out and see the sheriff ride the horse Naked. Uh, who had all those appearances. So go, <laughs> going back to your, and this is what the local news covered when I was there last week. I'm from South Carolina. We get it. Uh, that's really funny. But Matt, <laughs> kidding aside, it's what does that support team look like? And, and is it just one person? What if they fall off the horse or get hit by the bus? What's the contingency plan? Yeah. And, and contingency plan uh, aside, if it's just so limited, are you going to have enough support, you know, when you need it as, um, as T squared says, great to see you here, T squared. While support's key, that continued engagement during support is so critical. And if there aren't, aren't enough resources to support the support efforts, you know, where do we find ourselves? Alex, what yeah. else would you add to aftercare? And Kevin, I'll come to you next. Um, I think it's a couple of things. Um, one is just to be blunt, nobody gets it right. So everybody struggles with making sure you have good support. The right. goal is to get to great support. And so I would say there's usually it's a two handed approach. One is you want to make sure who's ever working with your systems from a supplier standpoint has a support base and that the companies that they're using and the technologies that they're using are going to be around for the long haul. Are they going to have support for their software, their controls? They're going to have support for their parts aftermarket. Are they going to be a viable organization? So you want to make sure that the technology company solid and people supporting it have the right resources allocated. The other thing is, you want to try to make sure you have people on site, whether they're part of the customer's team or whether they're part of the provider's team who really understand the system. And they get involved early. They get involved in more detail. They really understand the system. They understand the nuances because you want to make sure you've got people who are invested in it. And if they're on site, especially if they work under the company that is supporting, I'm sorry, that owns the equipment, they right. have a vested interest to keep this up. So you want to make sure they're trained, they're ready to go. And then you've got a back room of people that are supporting as well. So you kind of got full coverage. So you want investment from the customer as well as the vendor to make sure you work towards getting great. Alex, I love how you keep it real there because it uh, support is a industry struggle, right? It is an industry struggle. Um, Kevin, your thoughts on all things aftercare. You know, I, I don't know, maybe I'm getting jaded or it's just a sore point for me. But, you know, when you say support, my first question is, okay, what's the telephone number that's answered by a person right. when I have a problem? <laughs> you know, I, I am just so upset when you have a problem and you, there's no telephone number. You know, it's fill out it's fill out this form or you know, chat chat box is great, but you know, and I I use them all the time. But sometimes you get to a point where you say, Okay, give me a real person all right. that knows this, you know, and it's not an answering service somewhere. That's that's what I mean about support. Somebody who cares about the quality and cares about you getting back to your business. And, and that, that's critical. That's yes. important. Excellent point. Uh, and Alex and Matt, my hunch is, we didn't talk about this earlier, but my hunch is the human factor is alive and well in your approach to supporting your customers and providing aftercare. Y'all both are smiling and nodding. Alex, is that that's a pretty, that's a, a fair assumption to make, don't you think? Okay. <laughs> Thumbs up. We have a, we have a, health, we have a telephone help. Yeah, Where you just say, Matt? <laughs> Matt, you were about to add something. The other thing too is that if you if you're starting out with a point solution, and let's say you're doing a robotic depalletizer, for example, um, that's fine, and you can call that person for support, and let's say they have good support. But then you add in a small goods to person, or you add in some conveyor and some sortation. Now, do you have three numbers to Kevin's point to call and do all three numbers have that right. live person there? If you're working with like an integrator, you go to right. call the integrator, the integrator answers and supports all three of those technologies for you. So there's one bat 
back to Pat or throat to choke, depending how you look at it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, man, the power of integration uh, from an aftercare standpoint. Uh, can't sleep on that. It's really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Appreciate y'all's perspective here today. Really have enjoyed our catch-up chat. Alex, it's been too long. Now, folks out there, did y'all hear Ray Romano? If you're listening or watching, <laughs> did you hear that? It's almost, <laughs> if you close your eyes, he could be delivering punchlines for Everyone Loves Raymond, I'm telling you. Um, all right. So, Alex and Matt, <clears throat> uh, y'all are uh, out there moving mountains, but you're also out at shows. You're doing keynotes. You're in facilities, I bet. Um, staying on the go, but if folks want to connect with y'all, and Alex, I'll start with you. If folks want to connect with you, if, they, if something you said here today resonated with them, maybe resonated with something they're struggling or trying to solve, or, or if they just want to pick your brain, how can folks connect with you, Alex, and the Bastion Solutions team? Nope. Appreciate that. It's great. We are absolutely ready to take any kind of an inbound phone call, whether it's just a question of, hey, what do you think about this? Or tell me what direction to go. We'll happily provide any kind of advice or guidance for up the way up through someone who says, Hey, I think I'm kind of serious. Can you, can you give us your thoughts and maybe come check out our site or do whatever we need to do. So LinkedIn is always great. I think our contact info is in here, email, phone numbers. You can call me, you can text me. My team's responsible for making sure we follow up and talk to people ASAP. So thanks. Uh, I love that. And to your point, Alex, we're going to drop it right here in the chat. Uh, so folks, you'll be one click away from connecting with Alex on LinkedIn and his contact information. Some of the other things will be in the show notes as well. Matt, how about you? How can folks track you down whenever you're not on the lake and you don't, maybe you want to uh, leave your email and phone on the shore, but uh, Monday through Friday, I'll call it. How can folks connect with you, Matt? Uh, same as Alex. LinkedIn is always great. I'm on there. Um, email, call us. Um, just there's all you can always go to Bastion Solutions and just click on contact us and find us that way too. So there's many ways to to get a hold of us. We're obviously very excited to talk about supply chain, everything automation, and um, we look forward to talking to anyone who's um, has a need or has a want. And beyond all the supply chain cool stuff like we talked about here today, I bet Matt might talk Purdue. Uh, basketball with you and Alex might talk some space stuff as he he and his daughter <laughs> attend some really cool NASA events he was telling us about pre-show. Um, yeah. Okay, Kevin, before I get your patented key takeaway, and there's a lot, <laughs> I'm gonna give you a little extra time to figure out which one because there's I got 17 okay, pages of notes. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to share a couple of resources from the Bastion team here uh, to belabor their point. Uh, so up first. <clears throat> Check out this link here. If you want to learn more how to lead your market with smarter and the right automated warehouse systems, hey, we're dropping a link to a lot more resources and information here. You'll find that momentarily. And secondly, we've got a link to an entire digital library of resources at Bastion Solutions, which will help your organization increase productivity through proven, it's an important word, proven automation, information systems, and sound operating procedures. You can check out that link as well. And we touched on folks, we encourage you to connect with Alex and Matt. Um, Alex, uh, I love, um, you know, when, when you folks hear you say blog, you know, it's like when folks hear you say webinar, but I love y'all's blog series. And I love how it comes from all different points in the team based on what I've seen. So a lot of good stuff. So y'all check out uh, Bastion Solutions website out there as well. Okay, Kevin, man, we have run the gamut. I have you know, I like to pride myself yes. on knowing a good bit about a lot of different aspects of global supply chain. But I got to tell you, Alex, between Alex and Matt, I learned some new things here today. Kevin, what was what? What are your patented single key takeaways here today? The word of the day is Sherpa. Okay, <laughs> you want to you want to find your automation Sherpa, the one that won't send you down that dead end path that won't that, that you can't expand the one that understands the the long the road from taking where and meet you where you are so that you can get from here to there safely and uh, profitably right. uh, because they also understand the, what the accountants need and they can get that whole package together you know, Sherpa for your operations, Sherpa for your automation, 
and a Sherpa for your financial needs. Man, beautifully said, Kevin. And and to your point, <laughs> don't end up in the ditch. That's not the place you want to be. That dead end, no. the ditch, whatever. <laughs> Uh, but really, uh, kidding aside, Alex and Matt really have enjoyed today's conversation. Alex Haynes and Matt Cooper, both with Bastion Solutions. Alex, thanks for being here. And Matt, great to see you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Boiler up. Boiler yeah. up this weekend. <laughs> That's right. That is right. <laughs> Kevin, uh, always a pleasure knocking at these conversations. Yeah. This has been a great one here. Thanks for being here, Kevin. Yes, thank you very much. I'm, uh, this was exciting. I really enjoyed You know, when you talk about automation, that's really at the heart of, of digital transformation. That's right. That and the human factor that we talk about quite a bit. So y'all check out Digital yes. Transformers wherever you get your podcast. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Make sure you connect with Alex and Matt. Check out the resources. And most importantly, take something that Alex and Matt and Kevin shared here today. Put it into action. Your team is hungry for solutions that work. And especially if they're simple, right? Uh, <laughs> deeds, not words. That's the name of the game. And with that said, on behalf of the entire team here at Sapache, now Scott Luton challenging you to do good, to give forward, and to be the change. We'll see you next time right back here at Sapache Now. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone.